You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. Before we take a look at our Scripture today, I'd like to invite you to stop by our website, which is DesireJesus.com, and on our website you'll find links to our bookstore, links to both of our podcasts, our blog, and a link where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. Each Tuesday I send out a newsletter with a word of encouragement and some content to help you in your walk with Christ. And if you'd like to receive that each week in your inbox, it's free. All you need to do is just sign up on the website, desirejesus.com. You'll see the newsletter tab. Just click it, and we'll be happy to add you to the email list. Now let's take a look at today's scripture. Today we're starting a new series that's going to take us really right through to the end of the year. And we're talking about this idea of, well, you can see the title of this here, I Am Who I Am. Now, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to notice, particularly when you're going through the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a variety of I am statements. And they're significant. We'll we'll talk about the, the significance of those statements in just a few moments. But we're starting this series today, and even though the bulk of our time is going to be spent in the Gospel of John in coming weeks, today we're going to look at something foundational that leads to that. So each week after today, we're going to be in the Gospel of John looking at the I Am statements, but we're going to look at the first I Am statement that we find in Exodus chapter 3 today. So if you would take your Bibles, open up with me to Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 13. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 13. And I'm going to read from verse 13 down to verse 17 of Exodus 3. This is what it states in that portion of God's Word. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you, and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at your word together this morning as we start off our week. Lord, we're grateful for every adult and every child here in this context, and the fact that you give us the opportunity to meditate on the truth of your word, that you give us the opportunity to grow as we read these things and as we dwell on these things. And Lord, we pray that as we begin a new study, a new look here, as we, as we look at these I am statements that you communicated in your word, We pray that you'd help us to know you in a deeper way. We pray that we would understand more about what these things mean and the significance of each and every statement that you made. And we pray, Lord, that that we would understand more about your nature and more about the purpose for which you came. Lord, we're grateful for the privilege to be able to look at these things, and we pray that you'd speak to our hearts now and in the coming weeks as we look at these concepts together. And we thank you for the privilege to be able to gather together today We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I think it's probably an understatement for me to say this, but Jesus is a person of curiosity for many people. That's an understatement, right? To say that Jesus is a person of curiosity for many people. I regularly hear people speculate about who He is. I regularly hear speculation about the things that Christ has done. And it's very interesting when you compare what people say about Jesus 
with what Jesus says about himself. And you learn quite a bit about who Christ is through how he describes himself. Now, in the Gospel of John, which like I said, we'll be looking at in coming weeks, in the Gospel of John, Jesus made a series of I am statements. And they're all very interesting. They're all very fascinating. They're all very powerful statements that reveal, uh, they reveal to us aspects of his nature. They also reveal to us aspects of his mission that he wants us to understand as far as why he came to this earth. And in showing us, or in making these statements, you have Jesus intentionally showing us important details about what he's graciously offering all those who trust in him. He also made it abundantly clear when he was making these statements, and we'll see this today as we compare our scripture today with the statements made in the Gospel of John, but he made it abundantly clear through these I Am statements that he is divine, that Jesus is God who took on flesh and walked among us. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview of what's coming in the coming weeks before we look at today's foundational scripture in depth, but Here are the statements, the I am statements that we're going to see that Jesus made in the Gospel of John. And as I share these with us, I want you to think about what you think these things mean, because I think it'll prime our minds or prep our hearts for what we're going to be looking at together in the coming weeks. In John 6, Jesus said this of himself. He said, I am the bread of life. In John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In John, later in John 8, Jesus said, Before Abraham was born, I am. I love that statement. Before Abraham was born, I am. Not I was. I am. In John 10, Jesus said, I am the door. Later in John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. Then in John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. When we get into John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine. And then in John 18, leading up to the crucifixion, Jesus makes a statement where he says, I am he. And then in coming weeks, we'll take a look at what he meant by what he stated there. But each of these I am statements that Jesus was making they all hearken back to a conversation that God had with Moses that we just read in Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, God told Moses that his name was, I am who I am. That's what he said. Well, Moses said, who who should I say is sending me? The Lord said to him, tell them, I am who I am is my name. That I am is the one sending you. So when Jesus made the I am statements that are found in John's gospel, He was doing so in part to reveal his true nature to those who would hear and read these words. That's what Jesus was doing. And as we begin our look at this, we're looking today at Exodus chapter 3, and we're also learning today what it means to be people who are known as those who know God by name. We don't just know about our Lord. We know him by name as he's revealed himself to us. Let me... um, show you a couple things here, starting with verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3. Because as people who know God by name, I think one of the things that we probably wrestle with a little bit is his representatives, as those who claim to know him, is what should I say about that? You know, when people ask me about my faith in the Lord, when people ask me about my relationship with the Lord, what should I say? Well, Moses was wrestling with that as well. And let me reread verse 13 of Exodus 3 for us, where he kind of asks that question, what shall I say? It says in verse 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, how do you feel about the fact that the Lord has chosen you to be his ambassador to this world? How do you feel about that on a personal level? The fact that the Lord has chosen you to be his ambassador to the people of this world, to your family, to your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, that you're the ambassador of the Lord, that you're the ambassador of Christ to this world. He makes his appeal to the hearts of the people of this world through your lips. That's what Scripture reveals to us about how the Lord's operating in your life and in my life. 
Do you feel like a capable messenger? You know, when you think about that? I mean, when you look at Moses' statement here, what shall I say? Is that something that you feel like you could identify with? Someone who's been chosen by the Lord to be his messenger. You know, or do you sometimes feel like, maybe the Lord should have chosen someone else other than you, other than me for this task. You know, we don't always feel super adequate for this. I have to say, even though I accept this personally as a responsibility, as one who's come to faith in Jesus Christ, I don't always feel adept at it. And what I mean by that is this. I've noticed just about my own personality that I find it much easier for me to live out my faith and much easier for me to walk with Christ in a teaching context like this or in a written context. I find it very easy to write. I like writing. I like teaching in a group context. I find these things, and then just living out my faith. Those are things that I think at this point in my life come a little bit easier for me than the one-on-one face-to-face conversation. Sometimes it's in the one-on-one face-to-face conversations where I have to say, all right, you need to be faithful here too. It's almost like you give yourself a little bit of a pep talk. And say, no, represent Christ not just in a teaching context, not just in a writing context, not just through how you live your life. Those are all important. But also take advantage of the one-on-one conversation opportunities that the Lord gives you. And so this is a discussion I have with myself and something I try and be faithful toward doing. But of those ways of sharing the gospel, of those ways of representing Christ, that's the way that I would list as the hardest for me, as opposed to, you know, the, the context like this, a teaching context is a little bit easier for me at this, at this point. And I get the impression when I look at Exodus chapter 3 that this was something that Moses was wrestling with as well. So the Lord made it clear to Moses, and sometimes we, we, you know, people almost, they practically deify Moses as if he's, he's God Jr. And then you look at what, what uh, Moses actually says in this portion of Scripture. You have the Lord making it clear to him that he was going to lead the people of Israel out of their bondage to the Egyptians and toward the Promised Land. That was the mission Moses was being given. And when Moses is told these things, he gives God some responses that don't strike me as particularly spiritual ways to respond to God telling you that he's got a plan for your life and he's going to do some big and amazing things through you. You know, he questioned why God would select him for this task. Now, I think we could probably wrestle with that and identify with that. Could we not? Do you ever ask yourself, Lord, why did you select me to do this? Why me? Why not somebody that's kind of a little bit better at this, at least in natural terms? Why did you select me? Later on, you have Moses saying that, that basically he was hesitating to, to speak to the people when they were assembled. And you have God making a concession to him and saying, all right, fine, I'll let Aaron speak. But you speak to Aaron, and then Aaron will speak on your behalf. You have In this conversation that's taking place here, you have the Lord appearing to Moses at a place called Horeb, And the Scripture tells us that this was in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And you have Moses expressing timidity about the thought of having to speak to the people of Israel. And he asked the Lord, what should I say? What should I say if the people ask me what your name is? What should I say if people ask me this? And so in the subsequent verse, you see the answer that God gave him. But I find this passage very, very relatable. And I suspect that most of us gathered together today find it relatable as well. We want the Lord to tell us what to say when we're speaking about Him to those who may not know Him. We want, so Moses here in this context, he wants, saying, Lord, what do I say? Tell me what I'm supposed to say to them. They ask me follow-up questions. What do I say to them? We want the Lord to tell us what to say. We had an interesting uh, uh, and and beautiful uh, thing happen a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago. Um, A woman who uh, was attending the church here with her family, they've since moved out of the area, Um, but she she asked me, she said, "I, I, I can't shake this burden that I have to share the gospel with my family. My family, as of yet, they do not know the Lord, and I'd like to tell them about Jesus. I'd like to tell them about how they could be forgiven of sin. I'd like to tell them how they could have eternal life. I'd like to tell them how they could have the peace of Christ's presence with them day by day, but I'm not certain how to go about that. I remember the first time we sat down and met, it was actually during kids camp a year and a half ago. Out here on the playground, we sat down on the bench, and we kind of walked through what do you say when the Lord gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with someone? What portions of Scripture do you look at? 
what would be a, a, a great conversation starter, things of that nature, and we talked about that. Then she immediately went from there and visited with her family. And she had the opportunity to lead her aunt to faith in Jesus Christ. Then a few months later, she made a visit to her parents. And she had an opportunity to lead her mother to faith in Christ. And since that time, the reason she moved was because she felt compelled to be near to where her family was and others were so that she could serve as Christ's ambassador and just be faithful to proclaim the gospel to those who have needed Christ. And several more of her family members have come to faith in Christ. And it's interesting, and it was encouraging to me as I was observing this taking place, because I looked at this and I thought, okay, I know that in this context she would not think that she was God's messenger. She didn't think highly of herself. She didn't think of herself as somebody that had all the words to say. She was asking for some counsel, asking for some advice. What do I look at in the Scriptures? What do I speak about? What do I talk about? But then she went and did it. She spoke. And now there are more brothers and sisters in Christ that are part of the kingdom because she chose to be a faithful ambassador. She asked the Lord, Lord, what do I say? She asked her brothers and sisters in Christ, what do I say? And then she shared the word of God. She shared the gospel with her family. And now they've become part of the Christian family. And so you see Moses wrestling with that. We wrestle with that as well. What do I say? Well, something else that the scripture illustrates when you get down to verse 14 of Exodus chapter 3 is this idea that as we're speaking, as we're asking the Lord what to say, as we're you know going about our day-to-day -day Christian walk here, we're going as one who has been sent. You have been sent. I have been sent. We go out as those who have been sent. Verse 14, God says it to Moses this way. It says in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So we're called to go as those who have been sent. Those who have been sent by I am. Now, life is different when you approach it with a sense of purpose. Life is different when you begin to understand your mission. Life isn't about going through the motions. It's not about clocking in and clocking out, earning some money, taking some nice trips, upgrading your car, splurging on a few nice things for your kids. That's how many people treat life. That's what many people think that the essence of what a good life happens to be is. But if you know Christ, you've been given a much deeper mission than that. Your mission is much deeper than that. And Moses was being confronted with this idea of the deeper mission that he had been given. God's Word speaks of us as those who have been commissioned and sent into this world with a divinely ordained task to accomplish. Something that the Lord has opened up for us to do. All those who know Christ are included in this redemptive mission. Whether you're someone who's known Christ for five minutes, whether you're someone that's known Christ for 50 years, you are included in this redemptive mission. And in Exodus 3.14, you have Moses learning more about this mission and learning more about his role in this plan. And you have the Lord telling Moses to go to the people of Israel and tell them something specific. In that context, Moses was told, tell them that I am has sent me to you. And that's how God refers to himself in this passage. He had told Moses that his name was I am who I am. And now he was sending Moses as his messenger to millions of people who at present were bound in the chains of slavery. And Moses was going to speak to them. And Moses was going to, to represent the Lord to them. He was being sent by I am to, the, to these people. But think about that statement for a second as the Lord reveals his name to Moses. As he's talking to him, he refers to himself as I am who I am. And you're going to hear that phrase multiple times over the coming weeks as we wrestle with this thought. What do you think the Lord's getting at when he calls himself I am that I am? Think about that statement for a second, because it's deep. It says, I am that I am. Do you think Moses was wrestling with that in the moment, or do you think he was just so fearful and nervous because he was confronted by the presence of the Lord in this context that maybe he kind of dwelled on this a little bit after the fact? But if the Lord came to you and he said, tell them I, that my name is I am that I am, that's not a typical name, Right? It's not a name that you named your children. That's not a name that you hear other people. It sounds more like a concept than a name. 
But the Lord says, this is my name. Tell them that I am that I am has, has sent you. Now, when you look at that name and when you think about it, you start kind of dissecting it a little bit, it's clear that it could have multiple shades of meaning. I think on one hand, when the Lord says that His name is I am that I am, one of the things that He's doing is He's illustrating the fact that He has always existed. That He didn't come into existence, that He didn't just come into being, that He's always existed. He says, I am that I am. So what's he, what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, that He's always existed. Always no beginning, no end. He's always existed. I think he's also showing us when he says, I am that I am, that his nature is unchanging. Now, I'd like to use that as an excuse in my life for my hesitation to learn new things or try new things or do new things. I, I think the older I get, the more of a creature of habit I become and the more stuck in our ways. So can that be an application we take from this Scripture to get stuck in our ways? Is that the idea? You know, if you ask my family, I think they'd probably laugh about some of the things that I hesitate to try. You know, I'm at at this point now. We go to a restaurant, my wife could look at the menu and just just predict with 100% accuracy what I'm going to get. Why? Why why is everybody pointing to their spouse right now? see a lot of accusation in the room right now. But she knows, all right, he's going to get something that has grilled chicken and probably barbecue sauce. And if it's got fried onions, all the better. Because you've got to balance out the goodness of the grilled with the not-so-goodness of the fried, right? You don't want to go too far in either direction. So some of you are hearing me on this, okay, right? Um, But she just knows, right? And so sometimes we resist change, but here's the difference between us and God. He's perfect. We're not. He's perfect, we're not. So I'm supposed to be growing, I'm supposed to be progressing. When God says, I am that I am, and He illustrates that His nature is unchanging, that's comforting to me because I know that God doesn't all of a sudden just decide, you know what, I'm going to do everything different today. All that stuff I told you before, let's switch it up, right? It doesn't work that way. God is the perfection of all His attributes. We are not. So we're in the process of growing in holiness, but God is already perfect holiness. When He says, I am that I am, He's showing us that His nature is unchanging. He is who He is. He's the perfection of love. He's the perfection of justice. He's the perfection of mercy. He's the perfection of grace. He's the perfection of all His attributes, right? But I also think there's one other thing that we could draw, at least one other thing that we could draw, from the fact that God refers to Himself as I am that I am. And that's this that the created order finds its source in Him. Now, why would I say that? I think that's a harder application to draw from that term, but I think it makes perfect sense that the created order finds its source in Him. Well, when He's saying, I am that I am, what's He saying? He's saying that He is the uncaused cause. Right? He's the one who just is. Everything else finds its origin in Him. Everything else you could say, has a created source. But God is the, is the one who is the creator. The created order finds its source in Him. He is the I Am. And Moses was being told here to go as one who had been sent by the greatest authority and greatest power in existence. His authority, uh, His ability to speak and lead, it was commissioned by the one who spoke creation into existence. That's what we're being told in this passage. And by the way, Yahweh, the Lord, the I Am, is the one who grants you His authority to represent Him to this world as well. The same Lord who is calling Moses is the same one who is calling you. This isn't a calling just for Moses that we're supposed to read in the third person and say, yeah, it was an important calling that God gave to Moses. This is a calling that you and I should take direct application to as Individuals who are also sent out as his representatives, sent into this world, commissioned with a mission. Until we understand that as our mission, I think we'll probably wander and waste good chunks of our lives trying to figure out, why am I here? And then you look at what Scripture tells us. We're told that we are ambassadors of Christ to a lost and dying world. And he makes his appeal through your lips and my lips. And this is the purpose that we have been given, to glorify him in representing Him. 
Something else that Moses was being shown here that is something he was also supposed to illustrate to the people of Israel that I think we would benefit from focusing on here for just a moment is this, that he was supposed to help the generations that came after him to know the Lord like he did. Look at what it tells us in verse 15. It says, God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of, ja- or God of Isaac, the God of, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. I love that line again. Let me read that again. It says, And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now, As a dad, I frequently think about the responsibility that that the Lord's given me to lead and to influence my children. I think about that a lot. I think about that daily, and I think about that many times during the course of a day. So because that's something that the Lord's impressed upon my mind and my heart, I carve out time to spend with them. I try to notice their unique personalities and their preferences, the things that interest them. And I'm always looking for opportunities to teach them more about the Lord, more about His Word, more about what it looks like to live for Christ. I'm always looking for those opportunities. And I bring that up because I believe that that's a desire that the Lord plants in our hearts when we come to know Him. That's a desire that the Lord plants in your heart and my heart when you come to know Him. And it's also something that he was making clear to Moses was to be an ongoing priority of those who are under the banner of the Lord's name. Right? The Lord wanted the details of his name and his nature to be shared with each subsequent generation. I would suspect that the majority of you who are believers in Christ first heard the message of the gospel through a member of your family who represented Christ to you, who told you about the Lord, who told you about His name, who told you about His nature. Now, I know that's not everyone's story here, but I bet you two-thirds of of us gathered in in this room can, can tie back our hearing of the gospel to a member of our family who took that commission seriously and said, I am intentionally going to invest in this child. I'm intentionally going to tell this child what it means to know Jesus. I'm intentionally going to model faith in Christ for this child. And then you grew up into an adult who represented Christ and felt a burden to represent Christ to the generations that came after you. And Moses was being told, listen, this is what you're supposed to do. right? You're you're supposed to share about me with each ongoing generation, with each subsequent generation. Let me say this. And I'm just going to throw this out there as useful counsel, and I hope this will benefit somebody. If you're a parent or a grandparent or someday aspire to be one of those things, and you want to educate your children about the Lord, let me encourage you to do at least four specific things, none of which are rocket science, but all of which matter in a way that I think the Lord magnifies more and more over time. First thing is this, block off time to spend with your children and grandchildren. Intentionally block it off. Have a certain, you know, just maybe even have a few things in your schedule that are just untouchable time for those kids. Block it off. You know, I I have to say, one of the things that I noticed uh, prior to becoming a pastor was that many of the pastors I knew uh, were having a lot of trouble with their kids. And I tried to figure out, why is that the case? Why are so many of my colleagues having so much trouble with their children? Then over time, I started to realize part of the reason was because they're always focusing on the needs of of many people, right? It's a helping profession. So you're always looking to try and meet needs for people. You never know when you're going to get a a phone call. You never know when you're going to get a text. You never know when you're going to get an email. You never know when you're going to be almost like uh, those that are EMTs, right? You'd be called into service on a moment's notice, and it doesn't follow a clock. And their kids grow up watching their dad have time for everybody else and not for them. And then they grow up resenting the Lord, who they feel kind of took their dad away, or resenting the church, or resenting whoever ripped on their dad that their dad chose not to stand up to. And, and they look at that and, they, and they're like, you know what, I'll do my own thing. I'm not interested in that. And then I think to my, I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, I don't want that to be my story. I don't want that to be a thing for me. You know, I can't control what these children do necessarily, 
But I can control what I do, and I can block time off. And there are times that I could just disappear with them. And so, But this is what I've learned. It doesn't happen for me. I didn't really do that super well when they were younger because I didn't block it off. I got better, you know, maybe about 10 or 11 years ago. I, I realized if it gets on my calendar, it happens. If it doesn't get on my calendar, it doesn't happen. So now what I've, I've done, we have certain blocks during the week that everyone in the house knows it's sacred. You know, someone can try and get in touch with dad during those times and he won't answer his phone. He won't answer. He'll get back to them later. You know, there, he, we know that every three months we do something, whether it's just like a, a visit somewhere or, you know, a couple weeks ago we, I took the kids to a cottage up in Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. They know that every three months we do something. So guess what we'll do in another three months? Another something. So my encouragement to you from experience now as someone who has children that are now one at a time just becoming adults, right? You know, they're all at that stage now. They're not, they're not little anymore. They're all moving into adulthood one at a time. I don't regret intentionally blocking off time for them. And sometimes people have gotten mad at me for it, but not too often. People that would get mad at you for something like that, who cares? I always say it this way in my mind. I love my kids way more than I love your crabby mouth. I love my kids way more than I love your discontented personality. I don't care. If, that's, if you want to be mad at me for that, I will wear it as a badge of honor when I cradle my grandkids, hanging out with my kids who still want to hang out with me because I carved out time for them and I didn't bow to somebody that decided to be overly controlling or rude. Carve out time for them. Second thing, take a healthy interest in them. So I, I'm always amazed. I hope my kids don't mind me saying this. If they do mind me saying this, they're going to have to forgive me. Let's practice mutual forgiveness. But um, I've always been amazed at how four kids from the same two parents, eating the same food, growing up in the same household, could be totally different from each other. They're totally different from each other. They're all interested in different things. I discovered one of the, uh, well, let's see, what, three or four days ago, my wife telling me that uh, my youngest child listens to music I don't listen to when I'm not in the car and she takes control of the radio station when I'm out of the car. The nerve, right? <laughs> no, it cracks me up because it reminds me of me doing that to my dad. I think that's hilarious. I, I applaud that. I affirm that, right? Um, but... Different things will interest different people. And so if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, notice the individual things, the healthy things that your children or your grandchildren are interested in and file it away somewhere for a time when it's going to come up again. And I'll explain in a minute why I'm saying file it away, at least initially. Third thing I want to suggest that you do is read the Bible to them out loud. Read it out loud. You don't always have to have a lesson plan thought up or even understand where you're going to go with it. But if you read it out loud, people will ask good questions and you'll end up having discussions about it. Read it to them out loud. It doesn't have to be a whole book. It could just be a paragraph. It could just be a proverb. It could just be a chapter. Whatever you feel led. You know, when they're little, it'll probably be a little less. When they're older, it'll probably be a little bit more. But read it to them out loud. And number four, this is what I want you to do with the stuff you file away, as you observe their interests, as you observe their personalities, as you observe the things that matter to them, use what interests them to point them to Jesus Christ. Meaning, keep your eyes peeled for those teachable moments, and don't hesitate to share the wisdom that the Lord's given you through His Word and your experiences. Don't hesitate to share that with your children, with your grandchildren. Look for those teachable moments as you become adept at noticing what interests them. And I bring that up just in kind of a modern context kind of way to say, this is what Moses was being encouraged to do. This is what Moses was trying to uh, model for the people of Israel to do to help the generations to come, that come after us to know the name of God, to help the generations that come after us to know about the nature of God. Again, as the Lord has said in this passage, this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. 
Well, how would he be remembered throughout all generations? Well, he's remembered throughout all generations because he's, rep he's chosen you as his ambassador, not just to the world, but also to your family. One other thing that I think this portion of Scripture brings out that I think is extremely useful for us to notice, and that's this. As those who have come to know the Lord by name, we can see beyond our present day affliction. We can see beyond our present day affliction. Look at verses 16 and 17 of Exodus 3. It says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So as we wind down this morning, I just want you to think about these last statements that we're looking at here in this portion of Scripture. You have, during this time, during the days in which Moses was living, and for hundreds of years prior, it wasn't easy to be part of the people of Israel. They were treated harshly by the Egyptians, and in some respects they were treated like cattle, or they were treated like beasts of burden instead of being respected, instead of being valued as people. And the Lord told Moses that he saw their affliction, and that he was going to do something about it. And he promised that he would bring them out of it, that he was going to bless them with a beautiful land in which to live, and that their present affliction would not be their permanent reality. That their present affliction did not need to be their permanent reality. Even before we go any further, isn't this something that we need to hear from time to time? Our present affliction does not need to be our permanent reality. And for those of us who are in Christ, our present affliction will not be our permanent reality. As men and women who know God's name, as men and women who are blessed to have a relationship with the Lord, we can also value the mindset that, that the Lord was clearly here encouraging His people to possess. In this passage, He makes it abundantly clear. He's showing us that when we know Him, when we know our Lord, that when we know Him by name, that we, when we have a relationship with Him, that we can see beyond our present affliction. You will deal with affliction this side of heaven. I will deal with affliction this side of heaven. But it never needs to get locked into our minds as if it's a permanent reality. It is a momentary issue, not a permanent reality. So at present, some of you I know super well, and so some of you I know... You know, as I mentioned this year, I know some of the things that you've expressed that you're going through right now. Some of you right now, presently, are experiencing health needs that have you concerned. Right now, presently. Not theoretically, it's happening right now. Some of you right now are experiencing emotional needs. And you're looking at your life and you're like, all right, emotionally I feel very weak or depressed or discouraged. Some of you right now are experiencing family needs, things that have you deeply troubled or deeply concerned in your family. Some of you right now have expressed that you're dealing with financial needs. I got to tell you, that's something that, you know, at certain seasons of my life, I, could, I can think of times where that kept me up at night, sometimes just because of my own foolishness, but regardless of how I got there, just like, wow, all right, financial needs, health needs. Emotional needs, relational needs, family needs. These are not uncommon concerns, right? And at one point or another, have we not experienced essentially all of those things? Right? Every single one of us, every single person that lives on the face of this earth deals with most, if not all, of these things. These are not uncommon concerns. These are the common struggles that we face in the midst of our sojourn on earth. This is what it's like to live here right now. But again, for those of us who know Christ, for those of us who know Him by name, what are these things? They are momentary afflictions. Momentary. They last for a moment. They are not permanent conditions. Just as the people of Israel were emancipated, just as they were set free, so too we have been set free from our slavery to sin through Jesus Christ. And we've been assured of our permanent place in the kingdom of God. We've been assured of our own promised land. You know, as the people of Israel, we're looking forward to 
So let me say this as we finish up. God knows your name. Because God knows your name, be known as one who knows God's name. And rest in the fact that he who spoke creation into existence also holds your life and your well-being in the palm of his hand. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness toward us and your blessings and all the things that we can see that you're up to and and all the things that we recognize that you've already done. Lord, we're grateful that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. You've chosen to make yourself known to us, that you've told us your name, and in doing so, you've told us more about your nature and your mission. So, Lord, we pray that today as we reflect on the fact that you have told us that your name is I am that I am, and as we look at what your Son Jesus Christ said in his I am statements, showing that he is one with you, that we would understand these things in a deeper way, that we would grow in our walk with you, that we would have a confidence in you that isn't easily shaken or easily disturbed, but that whatever we're going through, that we would recognize that you are unchanging, that you are self-existent, that all creation came into being through you, and that if you can create and sustain this world by your word, that you can sustain our lives as well. So Lord, we pray that that would be confidence that we have in you today. We pray that that would be something that would be something that would just mark our lives as a character trait of those that know you. Lord, we're grateful that even though we we know we don't deserve it, but we recognize the fact that you are making your appeal to this world through our lips. So we are your ambassadors to this world. We're your ambassadors to our children and grandchildren. Help us, we pray, Lord, to represent you well in how we live and in what we say. And help us to redeem every opportunity that you give to us to be people who speak the words that you've communicated to us. Lord, we're grateful to be able to start off our week just spending a little time together in your word, preparing for what you have in store. And we pray that you just lock these truths into our minds and into our hearts and strengthen us for the task that you've granted us to do. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for all these things, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we'd invite you to stop by our website, which is desirejesus.com. And if you're not on our newsletter list, be sure to click the link to sign up right there on the front page of the website. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and we look forward to catching up with you again right here next Monday. Take care.